Okay, uh, so last time uh, we started talking about chapter one a little bit, and there's not a lot going on in chapter one. Well, I guess I shouldn't say that. Chapter one in this book is uh, a lot of like review of some math sort of operations, uh, how to use a calculator on certain things. Uh, so I definitely would uh, make sure that you go through chapter one. We're going to hit a couple of the highlights of chapter one and then kind of get into chapter two, which is sort of the heart of it. But definitely you should go through chapter one. You are responsible for chapter one. But a lot of it is sort of like maybe some review of some math and, you know, what happens when you add negative numbers together or multiply them and those type of things. Uh, so we're not going to in class kind of go over those that part of chapter one. Uh, but if you need some help on that, uh, you can definitely go through it and might review some of those things uh, if you're unsure. We're going to touch upon the scientific method here and then later we'll touch upon uh, sci uh, scientific notation, and then we're gonna jump into chapter two, I think. Uh, so the scientific method um, is really all about uh, how a lot of things in chemistry sort of get done. Um, and most all chemistry and science usually starts with some type of observation, and that's really key to the scientific method. Uh, you make some type of observation of something that's occurring and you're kind of interested perhaps in why that is happening or whatever you observed is taking place. So usually if you're interested in what you're observing and you want to sort of investigate it a little further, you then would write a hypothesis or come up with a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is a testable sort of, or a good hypothesis, is sort of a testable sort of explanation of the observations uh, that you observe. And in case of chemistry and other sciences, testable is kind of the important part of that. It allows you to do the next really important part of the scientific method there, which is experiment. So some type of experimentation can be done. The result of those experiments usually result really in most cases, sometimes a vicious sort of circle uh, where you observe maybe what you were looking at before. In most cases, you'll observe perhaps something else that maybe you didn't see before or know about before. Then you'll go talk to whoever you work for and they'll go, that's very interesting. You should go do uh, some more experiments. So maybe you will sort of revise your hypothesis, uh, do some more testing, and maybe you'll observe more things occurring. And it can sometimes turn into sort of a vicious sort of cycle of observations, hypotheses, and testing those uh, hypotheses. And at some point, though, what you're sort of looking for to come out of that is really one of two things. One thing is sometimes referred to as a theory or a model. And one thing is a law. And there is sort of a difference between a theory and a law. A theory is a tentative sort of explanation of what you're observing, but it can be sort of revised. So maybe people continue to do experiments on whatever you're looking at and they go, well, you were sort of right. Like these, this part of it's all good, but this other part, not so good. So theories can be revised. Theories can be found to be not correct in all aspects of it. For example, Dalton's atomic theory, uh, you know, describes atoms very well, um, but there are some parts to it that were later found to be sort of incorrect. And they were found to be incorrect because they didn't know things existed, like the existence, for example, of isotopes. So one of the things of Dalton's atomic theory was the idea that all atoms of the same element are basically identical to each other. They're all the same. And later on, when they did some nuclear sort of chemistry and stuff like that, they discovered isotopes, which are really the same atom, but they have different masses. And because they have different masses, that means they can't be identical to each other. So uh, that disproved part of Dalton's atomic theory, but other parts of his theory are still correct. Also something like Bohr and his model of the hydrogen atom, our theory of the hydrogen atom works super great for hydrogen, but if you move to any other element, it really doesn't work very well. So theories are things that at the time are thought of, this is sort of what's going on. This is the reason that's going on, but theories can then through further investigation, 
uh, be revisited, sort of, you know, found out, well, not all of it is good, or maybe all of it will be good. Now, a law, on the other hand, is a little bit different than that. A law is something that no matter what the situation is, always occurs that way. So it doesn't matter what happens. It's been found since the discovery of it that this is the, what happens. You could count on it in every situation to basically occur. So the idea, for example, of the law of conservation of mass. Law of conservation of mass says that when we do a chemical reaction, the mass that we start with, which are the reactants as a starting material, and the mass of our products, which is what is formed as a result of a chemical reaction, is the same. And that is, as you may know, when you deal with an equation in chemistry, we balance the equation, which means, you know, if we started with four carbons to begin the reaction, we will end with four carbons at the end of the reaction. They may just be in different things at the end of the reaction than where they started. But because we started with four carbons at the beginning, ended with four carbons at the end, carbon has a mass of 12 grams. So we got the same mass on both sides of the reaction. And that is because really in chemical reactions, the only thing that occurs is really breaking bonds, making new bonds. So we never change elements. So we have that conservation of mass that occurs. Also, you might've heard of the conservation law, the conservation of energy. We don't lose or create energy along the way. It's basically conserved. We think about energy as a perfect sort of exchange, which means if somebody loses a certain amount of energy, somebody else will gain a certain amount of energy. It's the exact same amount of energy is lost. Like for example, the classic uh, potential energy, for example, big giant boulder on top of the hill that's about ready to fall off. It has a certain amount of potential energy based on its position of being way up there at the top of the hill. When it falls over, it becomes kinetic energy as the boulder starts to move down. So that potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy. It's not lost. As it comes all the way down the hill and hits the ground, it transfers all of that kinetic energy into the ground. So all that energy that it had, it did transfer to the ground. The ground picks up that energy. So a very simple example is if you lit a match, right? If you lit a match, you can feel the heat, right? The match is giving off a certain amount of energy. The heat that you feel is all the surrounding air absorbing all that energy. So there's that perfect sort of exchange. So a theory is a model to tentatively sort of explain your observations and what's going on may not always be correct in all aspects of it, can be revised, while the law, again, is, is a little bit more locked into place. Always, you could expect it to occur this way every single time, no matter the situation. Any questions on it up there? <clears throat> all right. So we're going to kind of, like I said, skip through some of this. You can see here, there's a lot of key map skills. Again, if you need some help with that, make sure that you do kind of go through it. It talks about decimal places. Uh, you can see here, it also talks about positive and negative numbers and math wise, what to do with some of those guys. Um, so orders of operation when you do math problems. So this first chapter has a lot of that. It also has a calculator sort of part there, how to properly punch uh, these things into your calculator. Um, and things like percentages and solving equations, which is things that we would do in this class. So again, I would highly recommend uh, if your math is a little bit not your favorite thing, I guess is a good way to put that, uh, maybe go through that chapter in those sections to sort of help yourself review it. Truthfully, we're not gonna do too much graph interpreting in this class, so you don't really have to worry too much about that. The other thing that I did want to talk about, though, out of this chapter, which is really important, is scientific notation and how to properly write scientific notation. And in a second, we'll talk about how to properly actually punch it into your calculator, which can be actually more important. So a lot of times when we are dealing with numbers, they are sometimes really large numbers or really small numbers. Uh, so we can lose uh, perhaps some um, zeros along the way. So if you're going to take this number here, this 0 0.000008, and you're going to use it in a calculation, you know, you might lose some zeros along the way. Or even if we took this number here with all those zeros, again, we may lose some numbers along the way. Uh, so we do use scientific notation to help us do that. In general, scientific notation has this sort of format, n times 10 to the n. 
this first n is a number between 1 and 10. So that is a number between 1 and 10. It is not 10, 20, 100. Uh, so you should not use any type of number like that. One is okay, but uh, you can't use anything like 10 or above. You also can't use any numbers less than one if you're going to write it in proper scientific notation. So you can't do anything like 0.9 something times 10 to whatever. So it does need to be a number minimum one, not greater than 10. And it's got to be a number between one and 10 to do so. The Little n here is either a positive or negative number, depending on really which way you need to move the decimal point to get yourself to a number between 1 and 10. So, for example, if I had uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, very creative numbers there, and we wanted to write this into scientific notation, although it is not written, we would assume the decimal point would be at the end. So I would need to go to the left here. And if I went only one place, that's 123, which is definitely not a number between one and 10. If I go two places, that's 12.34, which is still not a number between one and 10. I do need to go one more place. And that will give me a number between one and 10, which is 1.234 times 10 to the three. In this case, we move the decimal point three places to the left, and it will be a positive exponent in that. 1,234 is a large number or small number? It is a large number. So usually large numbers have positive exponents. So that's a good way to sort of remember that. If I have a number like this, 0 0.000325, and I want to turn this into a number in scientific notation, I need to actually move the decimal place to the right. And if I do, that is 0 0.00. That's not going to do it. If I go one more, that is 0 0.03. Not going to do it. If I go one more, that is 0 0.3. That is not between 1 and 10. I need to go one more place. And if I go one more place, that's going to give me 3.25 times 10 to the minus four. I think I went one, two, three, and four. Again, four is how many places I moved that decimal place. Negative because I moved it to the right. And 0 0.000325 is a small number. So typically small numbers have negative exponents. Any questions on that there? By the way, speaking of writing something in a decimal form, it is good and you should always do this put that zero before the decimal point. Um, if you don't and you're writing a bunch of numbers and there's no zero in front of it and they're all decimals before you know it, all the numbers run together and you have no idea what number is which. So it's always good practice to keep that zero before the decimal point there. Any questions on that? So we can see here in this example, we need to go uh, one, two, three, four, five places six if I counted wrong there. One, two, three, four, five, and one more is six. There we go. To get me to eight uh, times 10 to the minus six. And here we would go one, two, three, four, five places to give me one times 10 to the five. Again, bottom number, big number, positive exponent, and top number there, smaller number, negative exponent. Any questions on that there? So you do need to be able to write things uh, in scientific notation. Um, you also should be able to take it from scientific notation to uh, decimal form or positional notation is sometimes referred to. So if I did have something like this, which is written as 1.5 times 10 to the two, if I needed to turn it into a decimal sort of number. I know that I need to move it two places and I do know it's positive, which means the only way to make this a bigger number, which is what a positive exponent should be, is I need to go to the right in this case, right? So one place and two places, uh, which would give me 150 in this case. So if you have a positive exponent, you need to turn it into a decimal. 
again, positive means it should be a big number. You should be moving that guy to the right to make it a bigger number. Just like if we had the same guy here, but it was negative two. Negative means it's a small number. So if I take my 1.5 to make it a small number, I need to put zeros in front of it. So one and two and put our zero. 0 0.015 uh, will get us there on each of those. Any questions on that? <clears throat> Do you have to write all your answers in scientific notation? The answer is for me, no. I don't really care which way you do it. As long as you do it uh, in terms of the correct number of significant figures, which we'll talk about obviously in the next chapter. Now, there is sometimes only one way to give the answer to the correct number of significant figures, and that is to actually write it in scientific notation. So sometimes the only way to actually give the right answer uh, is to write it in scientific notation. So uh, you would definitely want to do it then. You also would want to do it on any problem, obviously, that says give the answer in scientific notation or write the answer in scientific notation. But for me personally, you don't have to do it uh, for everything. Um, you just need to make sure that you hit the right number of significant figures. Yeah. So it is, it, it, is, it is opposite depending on which way you're going. So I think I, I understand your question. So for example, if we look at this example here, which is the 2400, if we're taking a number and we're going to put it in scientific notation, if you go to the left, it will be a positive exponent. But if you're actually going from scientific notation back this way, you actually have to go the opposite way. So it's opposite depending on which way you're going. So um, again, sometimes it's easier just to remember big numbers positive and negative numbers smaller, but it is opposite which way you need to go depending on sort of which way you're traveling, you're putting it into scientific notation or going the opposite way. But in general, most of the time uh, you may just be, thank you, thank you very much. You may be um, probably taking a number in decimal form and put it in scientific notation probably most of the time. So in that case, if you want to remember, move it to the left to put it into scientific notation should be positive or move it to the right, it would be negative. But it does become opposite if you're going in sort of the opposite direction. Yeah. Was that your question? Yeah, okay. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, so here again, we would go to our right to get 8.6 times 10 to the minus four. So this is really important, how to write numbers in scientific notation. And there's a few more examples, obviously, uh, that you could look at here. But I think more important actually is how to punch it in correctly in your calculator. And that is where most people really struggle. So let's talk about how you should properly, in your calculator, punch in scientific notation. So when you look at your calculator, Every scientific calculator should have an exponent button. And an exponent button is what we use when we put something in scientific notation. And those exponent buttons on most calculators is one of three buttons. It is a button that says EE. It is a button that says EXP. Or if you have maybe, I call them newer type calculators, but Oftentimes these are like two-tone type calculators. There's like a main color, like the side has a different color. Uh, if you have this num this button times 10 to the N, and usually if you do have this type of calculator, you will also have like a little wheel on your calculator that looks like that. Uh, so these are really your three exponent type buttons that you wanna make sure that you use for scientific notation. In addition to that, because we can't have a number that has a negative exponent, you want to make sure you also find your negative button, I call it. And on most calculators, it either looks like this or it looks like this. It is not the subtract button, which a lot of people use and don't get the right answer, get an error. So those are really important buttons to discover. Sometimes the button may be by itself. Uh, most of the time, the button might be above another button where you have to hit like the second button or shift button. Uh, but somewhere on that calculator, you should have one of those buttons. I would say usually on most people's calculators, the exponent button is usually somewhere in this area or way down here. 
This is usually the, like the two spots on most people's calculators uh, where you can find it. So if we wanted to put a number into our calculator in scientific notation, um, let's say we had 6.25 times 10 to the minus four, and we wanted to properly punch that into our calculator. This is really what you should do. And we're gonna start with these two buttons here. And we'll talk about what you should do if you have sort of that calculator in just a second. But if you're going to just put this number in correctly into your calculator to do a math problem or something with it, you would want to hit 6.25. Then you want to hit your exponent button. So either your EE button or your EXP button. When you do that on most people's display, it will probably look something like this, 6.25, and may put an E. It may go 6.25, pop up a couple of zeros, may even say like times 10 on the bottom or something like that. But you'll have some type of display that looks something like that. When you hit the exponent button, and by the way, I didn't hit any other button but the exponent button. This button represents the times 10 part which means you should not be hitting the multiplication button, should not be hitting second log or inverse log or shift log, any of those buttons, unless you like the wrong answer, don't do any of those things. So you're just gonna do 6.25, you're gonna hit the exponent button, that represents the times 10 part. That means that the only thing that's left at this point is the negative, which means you wanna use your negative button, once again, not your subtract button. So either this button or this button, one of those buttons, that's your negative button. And at that point, it will put a negative next to the E, or it may put a negative up here next to the zeros that you got going on. And lastly, we have four. So you would hit four, and that would put a four there. That will change this to a four. And that is the proper way to punch a number in scientific notation into your calculator. At no time should you be using the multiplication button. You should not be using the log button if you're simply just putting a number in scientific notation to your calculator. Any questions on that there? Now, if you have this combination on your calculator, good news, bad news, I suppose, yes. Bad news is in most cases, the way those calculators are programmed, uh, you got to put parentheses around every single number that you put in there. Otherwise, it will do the math incorrectly. So it's not a big issue. You just got to remember to put the parentheses around everything. So to do it with uh, that button there, you would actually start the same, except that you would open a parentheses. And then you would go 6.25 and then hit your exponent button, which would be this. And what it will look like probably on your screen is you have a comma, you have a 6.25, it probably will hit a times 10, and you'll have a little blinking cursor up there at the very top in most cases. At this point, the rest of it is very similar. You will hit then the negative button, uh, which again, whichever one you may have, it may look like that or the plus negative, and you will hit four. And then what will happen is it will look something like this, 6.25, times 10 to the negative four, and then you will have your little blinking cursor way up here. At this point, you actually need to close the parentheses, except that your little blinking cursor is now a superscript way up on top. It's not regular. And on most calculators, if you just close the parentheses up on top, you'll get this little, like, uh, it'll look something like this if you just do it up on top. It'll just close the parentheses like little up on top. And on a lot of those calculations, if you do that, you will get an error. So what you have to do before you close the parentheses is, this is where the wheel comes into play. You hit this button. And when you hit that button, that will drop your cursor back down. So it will then become regular size. Now you have a blinking cursor that's a regular size. And now finally you can close that parentheses and you will end up with something that looks like this. So if you do have that button, it's not a big issue. You just gotta make sure you understand how to properly sort of use it. 
and you really definitely have to put parentheses around all the numbers um, because of the way it's programmed. It will not do the calculation right. If you have either one of these two buttons, you really don't need parentheses. You can throw as many numbers as you want. They're programmed all good. Uh, you could roll through that. But the other one, especially on the kind of newer ones that they make nowadays, um, you definitely got to put those parentheses around each number. Otherwise, you will get the wrong answer. Any question on punching it in correctly? I think that will cover almost everybody's calculator that you probably should have. Uh, if not, make sure you come see me. We'll figure out your exponent button, but uh, that probably is most everybody. A couple of things about it. Your calculator probably will not give you the answer in scientific notation unless you have a program to do so. Um, and sometimes it may give it to you in scientific notation. So it will depend on your calculator and what your number is at the end uh, because it may run out of room. So that when it runs out of room, it pops it in scientific notation. So when you do get an answer, for example, like this, uh, let's say we had 6.25 and on your calculator, it, it pops something like this up. When you go to write the answer, it's very common people forget the times 10 part. They just write the front part of the number. So it's really important that you write the entire number and you do not write it as an E when you're given the answer. So you should not write it as an E when you're given the answer. You should turn that back into times 10 uh, part of it when you do so. Any questions on that? All right, so let's try uh, some here and see. So let's try a couple I think I got here. All right, try both of these, punch it into your calculator, see if you get the right answer. We got 6.2 times 10 to the minus 11 divided by 3.7 times 10 to the 22. And then secondly, do uh, 4.15 times 10 to the 6 divided by our times 7.7 .7 to the minus 12. See what you come up with there. Okay, let's take a look and see. So again, on the first one here, if I was going to punch it in, I would go uh, 6.2. I would hit my exponent button. I would hit my negative button, whichever one you may have. And I would hit 11. I then would hit my division button. Then I would type the next one in, scientific notation, 3.7. Hit my exponent button. That is a positive exponent of 22. So it hit 22. And then hit an equals there. And let's see what we get going on that. Uh, 6.2, negative 11, divided by 3.7, 22. And that is going to give us, for the first one there, we'll just do a little rounding here, 1.6756 and a bunch of numbers. And by the way, on my calculator, it does say something like this, a bunch of numbers. I cut some of them off there but it will say E minus 33. Once again, this is not how you should report the answer. Uh, you would wanna write something like 1.7 times 10 to the minus 33. So again, do not write E for scientific notation. Uh, make sure you do write it times 10. And again, sometimes people will oftentimes miss it on their calculator. On some people's calculators, uh, there is like a number and then there's like a space and then there's just like a number hanging out at the very end and that's your exponent number. So some people's calculators, you'll kind of see a bunch of numbers and there'll be a space and there might even be like a times 10 and then that number at the end, you want to make sure that you don't forget it. Did you have a question? Sorry. Yeah, so the, that exponent wasn't negative, so you wouldn't put it. So you would only use the negative button if your exponent was negative, yeah. And again, you want to make sure you use your exponent button, not your subtract button, which is, again, a very common mistake, yeah. Uh, we'll talk about why we rounded it to that uh, place. Uh, and it has to do with significant figures in this calculation. Uh, they both have two significant figures, so the answer actually has two significant figures. So we'll talk about that in the next chapter when we talk about, you know, how to... Uh, rounded to the right number, but that's the reason why in that case, yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, so the next one here, we're gonna put in very similar to it, 4.15. We're gonna hit the exponent button. And as was the question just a second ago, this is a positive exponent, so we don't need the negative here. So we're just gonna do six. Uh, we are multiplying, so we're gonna hit the multiplication button, and then we're gonna do 7.7. .7. Once again, the exponent button 
this guy is a negative, so we are going to hit the negative button, and then 12, and then an equal sign. Uh, so uh, we will go uh, 4.15 exponent button 6 times 7.7 .7 exponent button negative button 12 hit equals. And in this case, on my calculator, for example, it did not give it to me in scientific notation, the answer. It gave it to me as a decimal, uh, 0 0.0000. 000. I think I got them all there. Uh, 31955. So in this case, if you wanted to, uh, you could give the answer as 0 0.00032. Uh, you can also put it in scientific notation yourself and go one, two, three, four, five and do 3.2 times 10 to the minus five. So um, again, it may not give it to you in scientific notation. Um, so it's okay to give it to decimal as long as the right sig figs. And like I said, we'll talk about how to know that next chapter, obviously uh, with the number of sig figs. The reason why scientific notation is also really good, as you may know from what we're talking about here, a lot of times when you do calculations or pretty much all the time when you do calculations, you should always give the answer to the proper number of significant figures. And with that being said, when you write a number in scientific notation or you see a number that's written in scientific notation, uh, for example, like this part of the number, all of the numbers that come before the times 10 part, when you see something in scientific notation, they're all what are referred to as significant figures. They're all important numbers. So this particular number would have two significant figures. This number would have how many? Would have three significant figures. So the reason why it's really important as well is because let's just say you want to give an answer to three significant figures or you need to give it to three significant figures. And let's just say you have this number here. There's no way to put this number in like decimal form to three significant figures correctly. So the only way that you could do it is you would have to turn it into scientific notation one, two, three, four. Now this thing has three significant figures. If I needed only two significant figures, I could have done this. If I needed four significant figures, I could do this. So scientific notation allows you to really kind of control the number of significant figures you would need. And again, in certain cases, it is the only way to get it to the right numbers and different figures. There was a question. Yeah. 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 So again, as long as it doesn't in the instructions say give the answer in scientific notation, you can give it either way. Yeah. And more importantly, in the next chapter, you should give it to really the bottom number. You should never, ever, probably in this class or any chemistry class, uh, give a number that has like 4,000 digits. Yeah, So they all should be usually rounded down to the proper number of significant figures. I say that because I've had somebody give answers like on a test and then like had to flip the test over the number wrapped around the backside. It's like arrow over. I'm on this, the nine digits you put on there, the front page wasn't enough. You needed more. All right. Any questions on how to punch it in correctly? And again, if you're if you're struggling with how to punch it in at some point, whenever, just come on by and we'll figure it out on your calculator. But usually the way that you could definitely know you're punching it in incorrectly is if you do a calculation like this, um, this number is all good, but that number is just slightly off. And that's usually a reason like you're doing something wrong the way that you're punching it in. Yeah. Uh, this right here or no? That's on some people's calculators, that's what the negative button looks like. It's like a plus and minus together. And on some people's calculators, the negative button looks like this. So that's just the way the negative button looks like on most people's calculator. Yeah. So again, the subtract button is just this, nothing around it, right? So that's the subtract. Don't use that for, again, exponents or anything like that. But on depending on your calculator, that's usually the two popular ways that they kind of change the sign or make it a negative. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. Um, so like I said, that's usually the way you can uh, sort of figure out if you're just punching in correctly. Speaking of calculators, yeah. Hmm? 
yeah again that is that's that's the correct answer but that's not the way you should write it so you got to remember that on your calculator it might have maybe it said it looks something like what is that what it looks like It's rounded. We're going to talk about in the next chapter why we rounded. So that's worry about it yet. When we get to the next chapter, we'll talk about the rules of why we rounded, why we got rid of some of the numbers and stuff like that. But there are reasons why we did that. Yeah. No. So yeah. So it's just still the number. Yeah. You just want to round the right number, sig fig. So. All right. Other questions? Yeah. 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 It, it would not in this case. Uh, we'll talk about when we talk about it in the next chapter, but uh, the rule is the least number of significant figures. So the error number has two. So the answer should have two. So, so in terms of our answers, it's usually least sig figs and least number of decimal places is what your answer should look like. So that's why we did this. And that is chapter two, which we'll get to in 10 minutes. I promise. I rose. We'll get there. All right. <laughs> All right, speaking of calculators, one other thing about calculators, since it's sort of calculator in this chapter and stuff like that, is you do want to be careful when you're putting numbers in um, and you're, that you do things correctly. So for example, let's just say you were going to multiply, and I'm not going to actually do the math of it, but let's just say you had this number and you want to multiply it by this, and you want to multiply it by this, and then you want to come back and divide by this number and maybe divide by... Uh, you know, this number or something like this. So very common what people do is they want to just like punch all that into their calculator all at once and you will get the wrong answer. So if you do not use parentheses correctly, uh, you will get the wrong answer depending on how your calculator is programmed. So the general rule of how you could do it where you probably will be good on any situation is if you're going to, we're basically going to multiply up on top, right? In this case, and then come back and divide by what's on the bottom. Right. And in this case, if you have like a situation like this, numbers on top and then numbers on the bottom, regardless of what you're doing up on top, if you're multiplying up on top, if you're adding all the numbers, you're subtracting all the numbers, you can do as many numbers as you want on the top. You can do all the math, punch it into your calculator all at once. So if I were to do this, I would go 32. I would hit my multiplication button. I would go 1.25. I would hit my multiplication button. I would hit 42.55. That takes care of everything on top, right? It's really important at this point, you hit a very important button, which is the equal sign. Yes, hit the equal sign at this point. Now what you should do is go back and divide by what's on the bottom. Now you're going to be tempted to, I want to divide by everybody that's on the bottom all at once and you will get the wrong answer. So don't do that either. When you divide something that's on the bottom, there's multiple things on the bottom. You frankly could just divide each one separately, yes? So if I were to do this on my calculator, I would hit equals. I clearly would get a number at that point. I'm now going to divide by the first number. I would hit the division and then hit equals. That's going to give me a number. Then what's left is divide by the next number. I would hit the division and hit equals and you will get a number and happy face because it will be the right answer at that point. It is almost foolproof, yes? I say almost, because you know, I guess that could happen. But if you do it individually without trying to put parentheses or punch it all at once, much better way. People always screw it up. They want to like put everything in at once and divide by everything. And it's perfectly fine if you know how to properly, again, do it with parentheses and, and separate out. But if you miss like one, even one along the way, uh, you'll get the wrong answer. So sometimes better hit equals a few more times and get the right answer uh, than to miss it. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, so here's again, a few more examples of uh, standard formation format or positional notation and scientific notation. So once again, here we're going uh, this way, seven places it looks like. In this case, we just need to go one place that way to do it. And here also in this chapter, as you see, like we just went over ways you should properly punch these things in in case you, outside of our video here, if you need another reference, you could kind of take a look at this. 
All right. Uh, so take a second here, write the correct scientific notation for each of these and see what you come up with. All right, let's take a look. Uh, so here we would assume the decimal point here is at the end. Uh, so we got to go at least one, two, three, and four places to the left. That gives us 6.4 times 10 to the four. Again, that's a large number. So it will have a positive exponent. We move the decimal place to the left. In this case on the bottom, we need to go to the right to get a number between one and 10. If we go just one place, that's 0.21, which is not between one and 10. So we do need to go one more place and that will get us uh, 2.1 times 10 to the minus two. And again, uh, negative because we moved the decimal place to the right are again, large number, positive exponent, small number, negative exponent. Yes. The number obviously is how many places you move. Any question on that there? And once again, we'll talk about in the next chapter why we lost the zeros there on the first number. And it has to do with the sig figs. Okay, so taking a look here at the first one, uh, we obviously need to go to the right. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, and six places. Uh, and again, it's a small number, so negative six there. Looks like a winner on that one. Any questions on that? This one is not correct because why? Yeah, that is not a number between one and 10. Yeah, so you cannot have like a point something number to start your scientific notation. All right, on this one here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, so 7.2 to the seven. Um, again, large number will be correct as well. This is incorrect because way too big. Yes, definitely not between one and 10. Yeah. Any questions on writing scientific notation? More importantly, how to punch in your calculator, probably more often how you're going to use it in a lot of cases. Any questions on that? Okay, so I think uh, really that's all chapter one I want to officially sort of cover in class. Again, you are responsible for what's in there, but it is a lot of uh, sort of math review and stuff like that. So, and rearranging formulas. So like I said before, the chapter two, which is really starting the heart of it all, which is a measurement. And we will, as I promised, answer all of those questions of why we got rid of some of those numbers and rounded some of those numbers. So we're obviously gonna talk about uh, measurements in this chapter, uh, how to take a proper measurement, how to record numbers to the proper digits. We're gonna talk about significant figures. Uh, we'll also talk about some important calculations like conversions, uh, dimensional analysis, which is solving problems uh, using conversion factors. And at the end, we'll talk about density, I think, at the end of it. All right, so let us roll here a little bit. So measurements are really important. And it's really important whenever you take a measurement that, you know, frankly, if I wrote something like this, for example, 125, what am I talking about? I have no idea. I hope personally I'm talking about $125. That would be great. Uh, but maybe I'm talking about 125 pennies, which still wouldn't be bad. You could still pay through the drive through with your pennies. 125 apples. So we really have no reference of what that number means. So whenever you take a measurement, there really should always be a number part and also a unit. And the unit is really important. It gives people an understanding of really what that number represents. So for example, if this was 125 grams, then I know I'm talking about a mass in this particular case. So there is that frame of reference. So you wanna make sure that you always get into the habit of not only writing numbers, but including units. And that is both in measurements as you take, that's also in calculations as well. It's really important to make sure that you have your units there because it can actually make the math part a lot easier because a lot of times all you're doing is getting rid of some units and keeping others. So if you can see the units, see where they are, it will make the math part a lot easier of it. So obviously here's some different types of units and we do see units in everyday life 
And really, frankly, there are two types of units that we come across. Uh, there's the, what is sometimes referred to as the English system, uh, which is pretty much what we use. And then pretty much everybody else in the world uses the metric system. So there's kind of like the English system and the metric system. And uh, that obviously, as you might imagine, could create some problems, especially since people start to sort of to work with each other across the way. So believe it or not, in like 1960 or so, they had a nice conference on weights and measures. Sounds like fun. But what came out of it was really sort of for sciences and chemistry, for example, a sort of standardized system of units. So a lot of times in chemistry, you'll hear the SI unit. And the SI unit is really the international system of units. For all intents and purposes, it's the metric system for the most part. It's pretty much based off of the metric system, sort of one. Um, so a lot of times in chemistry, you'll see like the SI unit of this is that, or the SI unit is that. And it's sort of the standardized unit that's used in science. And for the most part, it's pretty much based off of uh, the metric system. So for example, these are all metric system type of deals going on here. Um, <clears throat> metric English, yes. We do Fahrenheit, right? Everybody else does Celsius, basically, uh, when they do temperature. Years ago, banks used to have little screens that would flip both of those temperature scales as you would drive by them. I know, they have big things that you would see those things. So as I mentioned before, <clears throat> the International System of Units, which is the SI system, really is based off of the metric system. And when we look at units, it's really important to understand what that unit represents. What type of measurement are we looking at? So for example, uh, volume, a very common unit of volume is liters. The SI unit for volume is actually meters cubed. Now, when we look at length, the meter is the SI unit as well, is a unit of length. Mass is grams for metric, but really the SI unit is kilograms that is used. Kilograms is a prefix version of grams. Degrees Celsius and for temperature, the SI unit is Kelvin. That's what the K stands for. It used to be called the absolute temperature scale, but it is the Kelvin scale. Pretty much in chemistry, if you're doing any type of formula, and you need to use a temperature value, it pretty much should be in Kelvin. It's a pretty much a no brainer. Uh, there's pretty much only like one or two formulas where you don't put it in Kelvin, but pretty much 99% of the time, you gotta go from Celsius to Kelvin and we'll talk about how to do that shortly. Uh, for time, it is seconds. This is the most common sort of SI unit. Now, when we talk about a volume that is a cubic meter, uh, for example, in terms of a volume, we can take three length measurements, like if we measure the length times the width times the height, and that will actually get us a volume. Each of these individual measurements, these are all length measurements, but when you take three length measurements and multiply them together, you get a volume, if I take centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, that is a very common unit of volume, which is known as a cubic centimeter. One cubic centimeter is the same as one milliliter. Um, so those are two very common units of volume. So sometimes we may have a unit that represents a certain type of measurement, like a length, but we may do a calculation where we kind of turn those units into another type of unit, like a volume, uh, when we have that. Any questions on that there? So speaking of that volume, uh, the SI unit is meters cubed. As I mentioned before, um, very common conversion is uh, there are 1,000 milliliters is one liter. So those are two very common units that is used for volumes. 1,000 milliliters is equal to one liter. 
as we just saw there, one milliliter is the same as one cubic centimeter. And as some of you may know, that is also the same as one cc, which is sometimes used in medicine, right? Give the guy five cc's before he dies, right? It's like five milliliters basically is what you're given. Um, so cc is sometimes used for a cubic centimeter. Uh, cm cubed is a cubic centimeter. A lot of times we use that when we're measuring, say, the volume of like a solid object. It's like a square or a cube. Take a ruler, measure centimeters, centimeters, and centimeters in three different directions, and that will give you the volume of it. So to get the volume of an object, there's really a couple of different ways you could do it. You could use something like this, which is a graduated cylinder, and that's a really good piece of equipment to measure out the volume of a substance. Uh, you just frankly just take a reading of it is one way that you could get it. Uh, the other way you could kind of get the volume of something that's a solid, like we just talked about, you can measure the length times the width times the height, all in, say, centimeters, and that will get you your volume that's in cubic centimeters, which is the same as a milliliter. Uh, the third way that we'll talk about when we talk about density is you could also take a solid object and dump it into something like water and get the difference in the volume between where it started and where it ended. And that's what's referred to as volume by displacement. So uh, 1,000 milliliters is one liter is used a lot. So I would say these conversions, you know, you will see a lot throughout the semester. Uh, so make sure that you sort of familiar with those. Uh, a couple other ones that does, I would say this pops up occasionally. Not a whole lot, but it does pop up. There's 946 milliliters in a quart um, between these two things. Uh, but again, that thousand milliliters is a liter is very common. Now length, uh, the SI unit for length is meters. Other common units of length are centimeters, uh, millimeters, kilometers, not so much in our class, but things like nanometers does pop up um, as well. Um, and these are really all just sort of prefixes um, <clears throat> that sort of changed the unit. We'll talk about those in just a second, but uh, there is a relationship in terms of length. One inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. Yeah. So uh, if you look at a ruler that has inches on top, centimeters on the bottom, uh, one inch will be that 2.54 centimeters if you kind of draw a line down on it. And this relationship is used a lot. There in one meter, there's a hundred centimeters. Uh, this one does pop up. And the other one that pops up is there are 1000 meters in a kilometer. That's another one that does pop up a lot along the way. <clears throat> there are how many millimeters in a centimeter? So if I was looking at a ruler that had inches up on top and centimeters on the bottom, the, these are inches up on top of a typical ruler, right? Big numbers that have numbers down here are centimeters. Little numbers down here are millimeters. Yeah, the little dashes, 10 millimeters in a centimeter. Yeah, so the little guys on the bottom is where you find those millimeters on the bottom. <clears throat> Now, mass uh, is the amount of matter there is in an object. And there is a difference uh, between mass and weight. So there is really a difference between those two words. Mass is independent of the force of gravity. Weight takes into account the force of gravity. So that is why you weigh different here than you would on the moon, because the force of gravity on the moon is different than it is here. Uh, but technically, your mass would be the same. So in chemistry, when we actually go and use something like this, which is known as a balance, which is a fancy word for a scale, uh, and that's the process of weighing something. Uh, we actually refer to it as getting the mass of the object. So you should refer to it as getting the mass of the object, not the weight of the object. 
and SI unit for mass is kilograms. Common units of mass, kilograms, uh, milligrams, obviously grams as well. Um, there are 1,000 grams in a kilogram. It's a common sort of conversion. There's also 1,000 milligrams in one gram. So those are two common sort of conversions uh, that is used. Any questions on that there? And this one does pop up a lot. One pound is 454 grams. The real number is 453.6, which you'll sometimes see. I will use that one because that's in my head and I just remember it. Uh, but you'll sometimes see that. Um, one kilogram is 2.2 pounds. Also why on our cars, right? We use miles per hour, but there's also kilometers, right? Per hour in the inner part of your speedometer, right? And that's because Europe and all those guys use that. Any questions on that? So you do need to understand when you do see a unit or you do sort of uh, say a unit, you should understand really what it represents. Uh, so if you see grams, you should be talking about mass. If you see some type of meters, you should be talking about length. And obviously if you see uh, some type of liters or something like that, milliliters, it is a volume. So you shouldn't say like, I just weighed that thing out and it was 400 milliliters. Okay, uh, let us uh, pick up here. So we've been talking about different uh, types of units. And again, it's important to make sure, as I mentioned, that you do recognize, uh, you do recognize what each of these units represent. So temperature is also another one where we do come across three different units. Um, and out of these three different units, really one of them we do see the most. Um, there is really uh, degrees Celsius, uh, degrees Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. And one of the main differences you can see just by the way it's written is uh, we do not use the degree sign for Kelvin. So it is just capital K, no degrees Kelvin or anything like that, uh, just K. We do use degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Fahrenheit is what we use for like our temperature and all that good stuff. Celsius is what, again, everybody else in the world we kind of uses for temperature. And Kelvin is pretty much exclusively kind of used for chemistry. Um, it's a pretty safe bet, as I mentioned, that if you're doing something in chemistry with temperature, probably the first thing you should always kind of do is get it into Kelvin. So since it's kind of an important conversion, let's talk a little bit how we can convert between these. I think it may be in a little bit later chapter, but just to make sure. Um, if we have the, uh, we want the temperature in Fahrenheit, you take the temperature in, actually let me rewrite it like this. You take uh, 1.8 times the temperature in Celsius plus a 32. So that is how, if you have Celsius and you wanna convert it uh, to Fahrenheit, 1.8 times temperature in Celsius plus a 32. Uh, that 1.8 is the same as 9 over 5, which is like a fraction maybe you learned as well. Same deal. Uh, if you have uh, Celsius and you have Fahrenheit, you take the temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.80. Probably outside of chapter 2, probably won't deal too much with these uh, sort of formulas. Um, the one that you will definitely deal with the most is if you want the temperature in Kelvin, you take the temperature in Celsius and you add 273 to it. The proper number is actually 273.15. Most nobody uses the 0.15, but if you want to, you can. It usually will get rounded off anyways, but if you want to use it, you can. But that really is the legit number there, the 273.15. But personally, I use it. Most people will just use 273, so that's perfectly fine. I would say this one, commit to memory. You use it a lot in chemistry, and so that one you do see. If we want uh, Celsius and we have Kelvin, we're going to do the opposite there. Temperature in Celsius will be temperature in Kelvin minus 273. So you're just going to subtract to 273. So if you... Uh, want Kelvin and you're starting with Fahrenheit, you got to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius and then Celsius to Kelvin. You got to kind of go all through all those things. 
again, out of these four, this outside of chapter two is, or three or wherever that temperature is, uh, is probably going to be the one that you would use pretty much the most. Second to that would be this, taking Kelvin, subtracting 273 and getting Celsius. But uh, that's definitely something you know. Now we've been talking about giving the answer to rice sig figs, and we're gonna talk about how to do that shortly. But uh, in terms of temperature conversions, if you are simply just converting one number to another number and all you're doing is basically converting the unit of temperature, so basically a temperature conversion to temperature conversion, uh, the general rule is whatever the original number looked like is what you should convert, converted number should look like. So what that means, for example, is if I had, uh, we'll call it 71.5 degrees Celsius, and I want Kelvin, I would put it into my formula, which is the temperature in Kelvin is temperature in Celsius, 71.5 plus a 273. I take my calculator, I would go 273 plus 71.5, that will give me 344.5 Kelvin, no degrees Kelvin, just a capital K. And in terms of sort of the right way to present your answer, if we look at it here, the original number went to one decimal place, our converted number here goes to one decimal place. So this is specific, not for all calculations. This is specific for only temperature to temperature conversion. We're doing nothing other than just converting the unit. That is the general rule that you follow. So for example, why don't you try Let's say we had, let's say we had uh, 41 degrees Celsius. What is that in degrees Fahrenheit? So take a moment, see what you come up with. Equation right here. And that means the temperature in Fahrenheit will equal 1.8 times 41 plus a 32 in this case. You do the uh, multiplication first there. So uh, 1.8 times 41 hit equals, then add 32. Yeah. So that's going to give you on your calculator 105.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Would that be the proper way to leave this number? It would not because this original number was a whole number, which means when I convert it here, 106. Yeah is really what we should be shooting for. So again, that is, again, the specific rule for temperature conversions. The original temperature value is a whole number converted to a whole number. If the uh, original value went to two decimal places, take the converted guide to two decimal places. Any questions on that there? So uh, time is also obviously important and seconds is pretty much used most of the time. Obviously, most of the time in chemistry, if you're doing some type of experiment, you're probably not going to do it for days, but maybe you will. But uh, seconds is a very common sort of unit that we use the most. By the way, uh, there are how many seconds in an hour? I'm sorry, how many seconds in a minute? We'll go with that one. Then. 60. How many minutes in an hour? How many hours in a day? Right, not 60, right? Sorry. <laughs> People very commonly mess that one up, like 60 seconds, 60 minutes, and 60 hours in a day. So it is 24. Remember, some of this stuff you should have common knowledge of, yes? That may not be provided for you. All right. All right, for each of the following, decide, is it a length? Is it a mass? Is it a volume? So take a moment. See. All right, so uh, kilogram, gram is the base unit. Kilo is the prefix unit. And that is definitely a mass, right? Meters is a length, right? Grams is a mass. And liters is a volume, right? Any question on any of those there? <clears throat> All right. All right, so if we're going to look at the SI unit for each of these, as we saw kind of earlier, again, the volume is meters cubed. But more commonly, uh, outside of the standard SI unit, uh, cubic centimeters is very commonly used. Uh, kilogram is used. And again, that is a very common unit of mass. But we do also use other units like uh, grams. 
the SI unit for length was meters, as we saw, and again, temperature being our Kelvin, as we talked about. All right, uh, identify the measurement given in each of these. So take a moment and pick which one is appropriate to fill out that, temp that uh, blank. Um, it, hopefully it's on there. If not, then uh, uh, maybe some extra empty ones in there. Sometimes may, maybe they think they got added later. So All right, so let's take a look. Uh, so we are looking for height, uh, which would be two and three. They are both length measurements, right? Uh, they're all length measurements, but the SI unit would be the meters, right? Uh, the other foot would be more the English sort of unit and yard as well, yeah. Uh, the mass of a lemon, the SI unit should be, yeah, it should be the kilograms. And temperature, Kelvin, right? Should be there, yeah. Any question on that? So again, remember those SI, you guys have those standard units, although they're all mass units in the second one, and temperature units, uh, that would be the SI unit. All right, so... Now that we have an understanding, hopefully, of units, let us get into everybody's favorite, which is measured numbers and significant figures and how to do all these things, right? So there's really uh, two types of numbers that we come across. And uh, one is a measured number, which is something that obviously is derived from some type of measurement. There's also, as we'll talk about, what is sometimes referred to as exact numbers. Uh, which are not really measured numbers. Those are things that are either counted or some type of definition. So the idea when we take a measurement, and it's really important to take a proper measurement, there's always some degree of uncertainty when you take a measurement. And that degree of uncertainty really depends on the piece of equipment that you are using. Every equipment is a little bit different. And it's always important whenever you go to take a measurement that you pretty much look at the actual piece of equipment you're using and figure out how far you should really take that measurement. So let us take a look at our friend, a ruler here to start with. Let's say we had a ruler look something like this. Close my straightish ruler. We'll call these centimeters, for example. And let's say that we wanted to use this ruler to measure, yeah, we'll go like here, this sort of arrow-ish type of thing there. So whenever you use any piece of equipment, there's usually two types of markings that you could usually find. And they're sometimes referred to as sort of the large markings and the smaller markings, um, our major markings, minor markings. So the large markings in this case, usually will have numbers associated with it. So in this case, we have a large marking at one centimeter. We have a large marking at two centimeters. So between each of the large markings, that represents a length of one centimeter, right? Difference between those two. The other important thing to figure out is what does the smaller markings represent? So what does the smaller sort of markings represent? Now to do that, you wanna count up how many small markings you have between the two larger markings. Now, 
the way that we start counting is like this. We take the large marking that we are starting at and we don't count that. We go to the smallest marking next to it. So when we would go count on this deal, we would start counting right here. This would be our first small marking. This would be our second, our third, our fourth, our fifth, our sixth, our seventh, our eighth, our ninth, and our 10th marking. So we do not start counting up the first large marking. We start counting just past it and we stop at the next large marking. And that means that there are actually 10 markings in this case between one centimeter. That means each of the smaller markings represents how much? Represents 0 0.1 centimeters, each of the smaller markings. This guy here would be 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3. 1.4, 1 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1 1.9, and 2 on the back end there. Any questions on that there? So whatever piece of equipment you're looking at, that is really what you want to do. You want to figure out large markings, what they represent. You want to figure out what the small markings represent. And that's going to allow you to really record your value correctly. So when we do go to record a measurement, regardless of who looks at it, there really should be certain numbers that everybody should agree upon. So really, no matter who takes a look at this, uh, they should agree that my line there is at least 1.4, right? So that is what you would definitely want to record. Uh, we would want to record somewhere here. I'll put it here. 1.4. These are what are sometimes referred to as all the certain numbers. Now, when we look at my measurement here, it's not exactly 1.4. It's not exactly 1.5. It's somewhere in the middle there between those two numbers. And that is where the estimation comes into play or the uncertainty in this measurement because I may look at it and go, well, I think it's kind of like halfway between those two. So I'm going to record it as a five, along with obviously my units. And this is what is referred to sometimes as the first uncertain number. Now, somebody else may look at it and go, I think it's kind of a little closer to like the the next number, so maybe it's like a seven, or maybe it's an eight, or it doesn't have to be five, or maybe it's closer to the first number, maybe it's like a three or a four or something like that. And that is where the uncertainty lies in this measurement. That is where the estimation comes into play. And you should always, when you take a measurement, record all the certain numbers plus the first uncertain number. And the reason why that's important is when you do that in a measurement, that is uh, pretty much uh, significant figures. Yeah. That would mean that my measurement I just took has how many significant figures? All the certain numbers plus the first uncertain number. That it, Three, that would get, that says three significant figures. So when you record all the certain numbers plus the first uncertain numbers, that is what is referred to as significant figures. And the estimation or errors in that last significant figure. So in most cases, it's like plus or minus one-ish of that. So what I'm really saying here is I think it's 1.45, but maybe it's really 1.46. Maybe it's like 1.44. And if you look at it, yeah, it's somewhere in that area as to sort of where it's at. And that's where the uncertainty sort of lies. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Now, there is a way you could sort of figure out how far you could take a reading. But in general, you usually could take a reading to one more place to the right of the smallest marking. So our smallest marking here was the first decimal place. We're able to take it actually one more place to the right. And that's how many decimal places our number should have. If you just want to figure out how many decimal places or how far you should take your reading, if you correctly figure out what the small markings mean, 
you could just take it and divide it by two and that will give you something like 0 0.05 centimeters in this case plus or minus but basically what that will tell you is that's two decimal places that's exactly how many decimal places my answer should have when i when i take this reading question on that so you could always divide the smallest markings on a piece of equipment by two and whatever number you get you could disregard that if you want but basically however many decimal places that goes to is really how many decimal places you should take the reading in general that is one more place usually to the right of the smallest marking question on that <clears throat> now it does change depending on what you're dealing with so let's just say we're going to take a volume reading here on a grad badly drawn graduated cylinder but we'll give it a try and we'll say that is 10 milliliters Put some liquid in there. Maybe we'll put some liquid in there. There we go. And we'll put some liquid in there. We'll go right out there. By the way, when we do put a liquid into a glass container, like water or something like that, into a glass container, like a graduated cylinder, we typically will see the curvature of that liquid, kind of exaggerately drawn there as a U. This is what is known as the meniscus. And typically, we always read from the bottom of the meniscus. And that is because what happens in this situation is when you put something like water, for example, into a glass tube, like a graduated cylinder, the attraction or detractive forces between the water and the glass is actually stronger than the attractive force between water and itself. So what happens is that water on the outside touching the glass is attracted to it, so it starts to rise through capillary action. So that's what gives it that U type of shape that makes it into that meniscus. And that's why we read from the bottom of the meniscus, because if there was no attractive force between the glass, all that stuff on the outside would actually be at the bottom, right? So it'd all be just flat. Uh, so that's why you always read to the bottom meniscus. Pretty much everything that you would probably see will have a meniscus that looks like this, like a U. There are certain substances that actually the meniscus goes the opposite way. For example, something like mercury, which I think they've taken out of labs for most schools. Uh, mercury is actually more attracted to itself than the glass. So what mercury does, it actually comes in on itself and it will actually create a meniscus that goes the other way if you have something like mercury. And you would actually read from the top of the meniscus because again, the actual volume is actually on top. But probably 99 times out of 100, your meniscus is gonna look like a U like that. And you wanna read from the bottom, but there are certain substances that could actually go the other way. Mercury is a very common one. So this is a graduated cylinder. We wanna read it the same way, which means we wanna really figure out the same two things. We wanna figure out what does our large markings mean in this case? That's a 10, that's a 20. That means my large marking is how much? How many milliliters? 10 milliliter difference, right? Between those two. I again want to count how much of the small markings I got going on between that marking. So if I take uh, this, we're gonna start counting once again past that large marking. So that's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 markings. In this particular case, I got 10 markings between 10 milliliters. That means each of those smaller markings represents how much? Each of the smaller markings represents one milliliter, I guess, in this case. Now, if I take my meniscus and sort of draw it as straight as I can that way, that would make this 11, that would be 12, that would be 13, that would be 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. No matter who takes a peek at it, it should at least be 16, right? Those are our certain numbers, right? We now need to perhaps make an estimate in this guess, case. In this case, maybe it looks a little higher than half. So maybe we call it 13, 16.7 milliliters this would be our uncertain number and that means that this measurement here would have how many significant figures it would have three significant figures yes the uncertainty our estimated digit in this case is which number it is the seven yeah so again what we're saying here is i think it's 16.7 
but maybe a 16.8, maybe a 16.6 is somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. It truthfully, it doesn't. I mean, you should obviously. Uh, so ideally, what you would be doing in this case, if we like super zoomed in on 16 and 17 marking, you would ideally want to sort of break up that distance sort of equally, maybe 10 dashes equally. So if it looks like it's like halfway there, maybe it's a five, you know, if it looks a little closer to the top number, maybe it's a seven, eight, or if it's a little closer to the first number, maybe it's a two, three, something like that, or a one. Um, so truthfully, the number doesn't really matter in a sense. So I'll put it like this. So if your marking was, if you were going to read something that's way up here, you probably wouldn't put like one as that last number, right? Because it's much closer, obviously, to the next digit or, or next number. So in a sense, it doesn't really matter, but it should be representative of sort of where the level is uh, and just kind of visually thinking about breaking that up sort of into equal parts uh, between those two numbers. Other questions? So as I mentioned before, we could also, if we're not sure how far we should take this reading, Smallest uh, marking is one milliliter, right? Which is a whole number. We could then take it usually one more place to the right, which is the first decimal place, which is where we took it. Again, if you're not sure, you could also take this and divide it by two, you get 0.5 and that's one decimal place. And that's exactly where you should take it. So again, you could divide the smallest guy by two and it'll tell you how far you should take it. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> now, you should always look at the scale because even if you're using the same piece of equipment, the scale may be different. So let's say we have something like this. All right, and then we'll put something, I don't know, we'll put it like right here, maybe. All right, so in this case, largest, numbers represent how much here yeah so our large numbers here still represent 10 milliliters when we count up our markings in this particular case i got one two three four and five only in this case that means each of the small markings represents how much each of the small markings in this case represents two milliliters, right? 10 divided by five is two, yeah. That would mean that this marking is 12. This one is 14, that is 16. And this one is 18 in this case. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> now, when I go to take my reading of this guy right about here, I am now between 16 and 18. What comes between 16 and 18? 17 comes here, yes. The best you could do on this particular scale would actually be 70, right? That means that this number would have how many significant figures? It would have two significant figures. The uncertain number here would be, or the estimated digit, would be the seven, bless you. It would be the seven, right? The last significant figure is the uncertain or estimated digit. So, in this case, we're basically telling people, I think it's 17, but you know, it could be 18, could be 16. Which one of the two would be a much better piece of equipment to use to take a volume measurement? The one on the left, right? The one on the left here, we could take it at least to the first decimal place, right? So that's like saying it's 16.7, maybe 16.8, 16.6. That's not a very big sort of difference. Here, we got that big one milliliter difference, right? There's a lot more error associated with that type of measurement, much better measurement to get in there versus there. Yeah. So for the first one with the closer minus 0.5 milliliters thing, yeah. aren't we also saying it could be 16.2 or 17.2 milliliters? Yeah, but in most cases, you would take a probably a fairly closer... Uh, sort of breeding. So that's what I was saying, like before here, like you would probably again not call that like, you know, uh, 16.1. So in most cases, most people would consider that last digit plus or minus one, but it can be in that piece of equipment that much of a range. And it does, you'll sometimes see it even on the piece of equipment 
like glassware sometimes they'll still show that like plus or minus something and you know but in the general rule is you know we kind of think of that last uncertain digit as you know kind of like plus or minus one ish because ideally when you would take a reading you hopefully wouldn't miss it by that much you know, in that, and hopefully in that case but you would be correct we could also do that on this by the way um we took our smallest mark in here divided by two that is one milliliter a whole number which is what we took that reading to so again if you are not sure when you look at something or you know as long as you can figure out what the smallest markings represent you frankly could just divide it by two and that will tell you pretty much how you should take the reading in most cases not all cases but in most cases one more place to the right of the smallest marking obviously this would be an exception to that you wouldn't go one more place to the right in that particular case question on that now let's say we had our same scale. We sort of ruler that we sort of looked at originally, uh, which was something like this. And let's say we wanted to, in this particular case, uh, measure like this guy right here dead on that line and this is obviously the same ruler that we used earlier uh, which is a uh, large marking here going to be one centimeter we have our 10 dashes which means our small marking here going to be 0 0.1 centimeters so that means again that this is uh, 1.1 1.2 1.3 1.4 1.5 1 1.5 1.6 and so forth. So looking at it, it is dead on the 1.4. So I record 1.4 centimeters. I record 1.40 centimeters. I record 1.4000000000 centimeters. Is there a difference between any of those numbers? Well, first off, that feels like a lot of zeros. So I'm going to say no to that one on that, that reason. But let's talk about each of these numbers. And is there really a big difference of how you report this sort of measurement? So let's start with what we know. So what we do know is this, that if I were to say that this is the measurement, that would have how many significant figures? It would have two significant figures, right? That means the estimated digit, our uncertain digit would be which number? Four. It would be the four here. So really what we're saying, if I report this as 1.4 centimeters, again, just assuming maybe plus or minus one of that last number, I think it's somewhere between 1.5 and 1.3. When we look at it actually on that particular scale, is it near either of those numbers? It is not. Right now, if I report it as this number here, how many significant figures does it have? As three sig figs. The uncertain or estimated digit in this case is it is the zero here. And what that is saying is, I think it's one point four zero, but maybe it's like one point four one, maybe it's one point three nine. That to me looks what we are seeing here, right? So there actually is a difference between those numbers and how you report it. And the reason that we should do it to this number is because we have the ability to do so on that particular piece of equipment. And we know that by dividing this by two, it gives us 0 0.05 or two decimal places, right? One more place to the right. That is where we should record it. By lopping off a zero like we did here, we frankly made that measurement much more crappy. Yes, it's a crappier measurement. And you shouldn't have a crappier measurement because it's gonna make all of your measurements more crappy when it doesn't need to be because it should be a much better measurement that we see here. A lot less error than it is saying, I think it's somewhere in like this range, right? When it clearly is somewhere in that range, right? So it's really important. It's a very common mistake that a lot of people make is, oh, yeah, it's on the nose. I don't need to add anything to it. I'm just going to record what it says. If you have the ability to do so, like we do in this particular piece of equipment, 
you need to preserve the proper number of significant figures by adding a zero to preserve that and keeping the measurement what it really should be and not making it a worse measurement. Um, so keep that in mind when you do that, you may have to add a zero. The opposite is true as well. You shouldn't add a lot more zeros to make it more chemistry-ish, like science-like, because that implies that that is, I don't know how you would measure that, but you have a lot of ways. You can really get right down there to exactly where it's hanging out, which clearly you cannot do on that, right? So you shouldn't go one way or the other, but you do sometimes need to maintain uh, the number of significant figures by adding a zero to maintain the proper measurement so you're not making it a worse measurement. Any questions on that there? The other thing commonly that people mess up on is they go use like a balance, like the scale. And if it's digital, anything that is digital that has a digital reading, you should record all the numbers that are there. They're there for a reason. They are significant, yeah? So a lot of times people go to a balance the way something it goes like 52.365 grams. Yeah, 52 sounds good. Yeah, so you just made your measurement a lot worse. So make sure you always look at the scale, make sure you figure out how far you should take it. You should always take the measurement to the proper number of sig figs. And you should also obviously include the units and all those things. Any questions on any of that there? You wouldn't, you would actually record whatever's there on digital. So anything that's a digital display, uh, you typically record whatever's there. So uh, for example, a lot of balances, it's been a while since I've been up there, but are over there. But uh, you may have ones that go to two decimal places or three decimal places. Uh, some have analytical balances that go to like four or five decimal places. So typically if it's a digital sort of display, usually all the numbers are important and you should usually record all those numbers. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. All right, so taking a look at this here, looking at some examples, uh, this is obviously a measured number. Here on this particular scale, our large numbers is one centimeter, right? Our small number is also one centimeter. There is no smaller numbers, right? Uh, so in this particular case, our large markings and small markings are the same in this case. They're both one centimeter which means in this particular case, something like 4.5 centimeters would be the best you could do there. That would have how many significant figures? Uncertain number, estimated number would be, by the way, the estimated number or uncertain number is not always the last number written, but it is always the last significant figure written. Okay, so in a lot of cases it is the last number, but not in all cases. So it's always the last significant figure that is risen. All right. Hopefully they agree with us. Here's our ruler like we were looking at. Again, uh, we have large marking here, which is one centimeter. Uh, we have our 10 small markings, which means that each of those smaller guys are 0.1 of a centimeter. Usually again, we could go one more place to the right. So that's going to give us 4.5, which is here, and it's between 4.5 and 4.6. So here, 4.55 centimeters, the last five there being our estimated digit, this guy having three significant figures. Yes. Here again, same deal, dead on three in this case. Large markings, small markings are both one centimeter, which means we can go to the first decimal place. So once again here, we would record 3.0 centimeters, which this being our uncertain or estimated digit, this having two significant figures, right? If I just reported three centimeters, which would be incorrect in this case, how many significant figures does it have? There's only one, right? It's only one number there, which means I think it's three, but maybe it's like two or four, right? So that's again, a pretty big room for error, which we don't see here. So uh, again, we would not want to lop off that zero, even if we hit exactly on a number. All right, uh, take a reading here. I think some things moved with, with uh, this, but I think we're okay. That's a that's a nine that's there and that 10 goes to that marking i think so give it a go see what you come up with here
All right, so here, uh, that is a nine that got kind of run over by the line that got moved, and that's a 10, that big marking. Uh, so our large markings here is going to be, again, one centimeter. We have 10 little dashes, again, starting there and going to their next big guy, which is here. And that means that each of the small markings, once again, is 0.1 centimeter, which tells us in most cases, in this case included, we could go one more place to the right. And that line is ending up right here at 9.2, which means it does need to be this guy here, 9.20 centimeters, which has three significant figures with the zero at the end being the uncertain number. Uh, no, uh, so this marking right here is nine and this marking right here is 10 and it got a little moved with PowerPoint, but uh, these are really the small markings here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. That means each of these are 0.1, which means this marking right here is 9.1. This marking right here is 9.2 and then 9.3 all the way up to 10 as you go to the right there. Other questions? Okay. So we've been talking about significant figures with measurements here. And let's actually talk about how we count significant figures here, just to kind of finish up a little bit here. When we count significant figures, there are some rules. And the first rule is pretty simple. All non-zero numbers are significant. So if I had a number like three, two, five, this number would have how many significant figures? It would have three significant figures. By the way, we always count left to right, and we do not start counting until we hit the first non-zero. So in this case, the first non-zero is three, and then the rest of them are non-zeros as well. So that would be three significant figures. Now there are zeros, and zeros give people a little bit of trouble. So the first type of zero is what is called a leading zero. And those are not significant. So if I have something like this, 0. 0.00011, how many significant figures would this number have? We'll have only two. I will take all these guys as zeros and I have not hit the very first non-zero. I do not start counting until I get to that guy. That's my very first non-zero. Then I have a one and a one, which means this guy has two significant figures in this case, yeah? Always wanna start left to right again, start counting at the first non-zero. Now there are some zeros that are trapped zeros, are captive zeros. And those are significant. So four, zero, zero, four. We would start counting here. These zeros are trapped between two non-zero numbers, which makes them significant. And that is a non-zero, which means this guy would have four significant figures in this particular case. The last type of zero is the one that gives people probably the most trouble and this is the trailing zero. And this may or may not be significant. And what determines whether or not this guy is going to be significant is, is there a decimal point anywhere in the number? So if there is a decimal point in the number that will make that number significant so if i write a number like this which is 600 how many significant figures does this one have this was a measurement we'll start with this is this significant the six it is now we have two zeros at the end are they significant is there a decimal point in that number are they significant? Is there a decimal point in that number? Are they significant? I'm just gonna keep asking the same questions for the next five minutes and say, there is no decimal point written, right? In this case, we're not going to assume it's there. It needs to be there. 
So because it is not written, these guys are not significant. This would have one significant figure and it would just be the six. If I wrote it like this, this would have how many significant figures here? This would have three significant figures. The six is significant. These zeros are significant because there is a decimal point there. Uh, so that would be three significant figures in this particular case. All right, well, what happens if I have this number? How many significant figures is that? It does have two, right? Uh, these are significant. These zeros are not significant because there's not a decimal point written in the number. What is the estimated digit or uncertain digit in that number I just wrote? That is two zero and I don't know. I like the honesty is good. <laughs> the estimated digit or uncertain digit is the last significant figure, right? Which one is the last significant figure in that number? It is actually the two. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Not in all cases is the estimated digit or uncertain digit the last one written. It happens to be in a lot of cases, but in this particular case, the last significant figure is actually the two, right? Now, for example, if I wanted this number to have three significant figures, as I talked about before, I got to go 1.20 times 10 to the four, which would have three significant figures, right? And you cannot get this number to three significant figures as much as you would want to try without doing it in scientific notation. If I wrote this, is it three significant figures? Is it the same number? It is not, right? 120, 12,000, big difference. So there is only one way you could get that number to three significant figures. If you needed it to three significant figures, uh, would be to write scientific notation. All right, to end on here, this number here that I am writing. I'm going to add extra because you said, oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. How many, oh my gosh, significant figures do we have there? Honestly, I don't know either because I just write numbers, frankly. So let's see. Here we go. Wait. All right. I'm going to be quiet. Eighteen, fourteen, sixteen. <laughs> it's somewhere between zero and like a hundred. It's somewhere there. All right, let's do it together here. All right. Any of those significant? Now I'm not going to start counting until I get here, right? So that is significant. This would then be significant. These zeros are trapped, which means they are significant. That is significant. These zeros are also trapped, right? Which means they're significant. These zeros are still trapped because somebody said, oh my. So I had to add some more. So uh, that is going to be significant. So that leaves us our zeros at the end. Are they significant? That is both answers. So one of those should be right. And the one that's right is, I see a decimal. It doesn't have to be near the zeros. So those are significant. So this guy would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and... 15 significant figures. So this illustrates a extreme point here. Uh, the decimal point does not have to be right next to those zeros, but it just needs to be anywhere in the number to make the zeros at the end significant. Hey, all right.